Okay, folks, well, uh, we'll start on the final talk for the afternoon. Um, in keeping with what seems to be the uh, security theme of the year, containers, uh, Stefan Graeber and uh, Tycho Anderson from Canonical uh, will be giving a talk on, on the way to safe containers. Thanks. Thank you. Um, right, so I'm Stefan Graeber. I work at Canonical as the technical lead for LexD, which is our current main container project, but I'm also the um, project leader for LXE, LXD, LXCFS, all of those things. Um, I've got Taiko right here, who's working on my team. He mostly does the crazy checkpoint restore stuff that some people have mentioned earlier today. Um, and other LXD work. Um, right, so briefly, if somebody doesn't know, what's LXD? Uh, so it's a container management tool. Um, it's built on top of LXC. It's not like something completely fancy and new in that regard. We're using the LXC library. Uh, it's, be, it's designed to be quite simple, yet um, quite comprehensive in what it covers. So it's like, if you've ever used the LXC command line tool and its configuration, it wasn't particularly obvious how to do things. It's massively better with LXD. Uh, it also works as a daemon, which has root, which gives us like a bunch more nice features that we can have compared to the FM role kind of process LXC used to be doing. Um, it also offers a REST API, which is great for scripting. Um, new command line tool, as I mentioned, is, is great. Um, I don't have to tell you why containers are faster than virtual machines. You all know that already, so that's great. Um, and we consider it to be safe, and that's basically the subject of that talk, uh, which means we do use just about every single kernel feature we can get our hands off on to make things safe, which does include the user namespace. That's the main one, but we also use all the others, and I'm going to go through those in a tiny bit. Um, and it's very scalable in the sense that you can, it works just as well on your laptop as it would on 50 other nodes or something. So you can, with the exact same tools, uh, test on a single machine or go to like a small business kind of setup. Or you can even then go using an, um, an OpenStack plugin and go to thousands of compute nodes as part of an existing OpenStack deployment. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like as far as deployments. You usually have a bunch of physical hosts. You've got the Linux kernel on there. You, if you care about live migration in any way, you cannot want to have the same Linux kernel and vaguely the same hardware underneath. Otherwise, things might go pretty badly. Um, then we've got LXC, as in the LXC library. And LXD sits on top of that, uses the LXC library to create containers and manage all that stuff. Uh, then you get the REST API, and you've got a bunch of clients on there. We write a command line tool. We also write the OpenStack plugin called Nova LXD, and or you can just write your own or even use curl as I've been used once. Well, I've been demonstrating occasionally yeah, talks and stuff. Um, so while well, it isn't, um, it's yeah, not another VM technology, yeah, it's container based. Uh, also, um, we focus on your system containers. So what James was describing earlier, like all of our containers do have a PID one. They are usually like a clean distro image. We support most of the Linux distributions inside our uh, containers. Um, and that's pretty much it for what it is. Uh, we, we don't have like any interest as far as application containers. Um, we're perfectly fine with people using Docker or Rocket. In fact, we even support running Docker inside an unprivileged XD container. Um, if you've got like some kind of concern around there, or if you've got problems with your UIDs and GIDs inside image images, you can just use an unprivileged XD container, then run Docker in privileged mode inside there, and that's fine. Um, so, security bits. Uh, what do we use? So, we um, the past two speakers have gone, have gone through all the namespaces. I don't have to go out again. Uh, we use all of them. Um, we've been spending quite a bit of development time um, over the past year to do the EC Group namespace one, uh, which was originally done by Google for the EC Group V2 um, uh, unified hierarchy code base, but we needed it to work for C Group V1. So Serge Allen has been doing that for us. Um, we've been using that ever since. Um, as far as the LSMs, we LX itself supports both SC Linux and Aparma. Um, LXT itself only cares about Aparma right now because that's what ships with Ubuntu, and we haven't had any contributions from other distros to support something else. Um, so we do generate like custom Aparma profiles and that kind of stuff for every container. Um, we do drop some capabilities, but again, we are running full system containers. We're not running like a tiny app thing, so we can't really know what the application is going to be inside the container, and we really don't care. So we only drop 
capabilities that you will never need. Um, so things like uh, right now Mac override, uh, another one, Mac admin, uh, SysTime, um, that kind of stuff, uh, load module, that kind of thing. Um, but everything else we basically need to keep. I mean, we need to have CapSys admin in there, we need to have CapSys admin in there, otherwise your container just won't boot. Um, and we use C groups. Um, and a fair amount of that talk is going to be around C groups and why they're great and why they're really bad. Uh, and hopefully what we can do to try and make them better. Um, so, and that's the C group parts kind of thing. Resource limits. That's something I spent quite a bit of time over the past year doing in NextD. Uh, we needed a user-friendly way of defining what kind of limits you want on your containers and have that applied to them. So what we do support is things like CPU limits, so that means uh, limiting either giving a number of cores you want and next day we do the load balancing for you and do CPU pinning on a point scene with um, the CPU set controller or limiting CPU time either as a percentage, which then expands to CPU shares, or as a time budget, say 10 milliseconds out of every 150 milliseconds, which is then set as a CFS quota, uh, also through the CPU controller. Um, for memory, we support the usual set. We don't, let, we don't expose things like kernel memory directly to our users because there's, nobody can figure out what the right limit is for those. Uh, but for normal amount of memory for the user space um, applications, we let you set quotas, either in percentage or fixed quota. Then you can turn swapping on, and on or off for every container. And if swapping is on, you can even set the swap priority to specify basically what container is going to get swapped out first. We do that through the C group uh, memory controller using swappiness and the, the limit in bytes kind of limits um, in there. Um, we also do disk space. That one is a bit, it's not actually tied to C groups or any or not. Um, it's basically if your file system supports quotas in a way that is vaguely useful for containers, we will set that for you. Right now, that means BRFS and ZFS support those quotas because we can do per sub volume or per file system, depending on the naming of the feature, um, quotas. Um, everything else, not so much. Uh, if you use the LVM plus X4 or uh, LVM plus XFS storage backend in XD, in theory we could do quotas, but shrinking a live fast system doesn't work so well. Um, so the user experience is not so great, and we've not spent many, uh, much resources in there right now. Um, we also do um, network I.O. limits. Um, those basically end up setting uh, QDisk, TC kind of rules um, to slow down your incoming and outgoing network traffic for containers. Um, also not particularly interesting. Oh, and we also support something like uh, for CPU, for block, and for network, we let you set like an overhaul priority thing. So if your host is under load, you can choose what containers are gonna win as far as the schedule is concerned. Um, that's so pretty useful. It's basic score that the user can set from one to 10, and uh, we set the right magic underneath. Um, and last one is, as far as like running, like giving random people access to containers, uh, it's what's the most important uh, is are the kernel resources. And right now, and that's a bit annoying, but hopefully we can make some improvements there. Uh, the only C group that's related to Dart is the PID C group, which was introduced reasonably recently. Was it like 4.2 or something like that? Um, which is great to prevent like a straightforward fork bump. Um, not so great if you're trying to um, run the kernel out of any other shared resources. Um, yeah, it's not that great. There are a bunch um, that we know of that people have usually had to work around because you can actually hit those by accident, not even just when tr someone's trying to attack you, but just by accident. Uh, I notify handles. Um, that's been a bit of a problem because you only get 512 per user because so that basically means 512 to share with all your containers which it turns out is not quite enough when you've got an init system that really likes to use them, like systemd. Um, we were getting to the point where you would only be able to start like 15 containers before you run out of unnotified handles, and well-written software should fall back to doing polling, systemd doesn't, and it just basically fails. You just have init running, but nothing underneath it. Um, so most people have to bump that right now. Uh, this one has actually been worked on. Uh, I believe that, like, there's a patch set to tie those to user namespace um, because they don't have 
a real reason for being a global limit. Uh, it's more like a safety net kind of thing than anything else. So telling that to user namespace will then give us that kind of limit per container instead, and that's gonna solve that one. Um, there are a bunch of network tables that are the same kind of problem. Um, I was giving a talk yesterday. I run a security contest, CTF kind of event, every year in Montreal. Part of that involves running a pretty reasonable amount of containers, like 15,000 or so. Um, that simulate the internet. And so we end up with about 3.3 million writing table entries or something like that, uh, which doesn't fit in the default limit. And so that means that an unprivileged user can, as a complete nobody user on the system, completely fill your neighborhood table on the, on the kernel to the point where you cannot open a new IPv6 socket. Um, and there are some other network related tables that are similarly, similarly shared that are not tied to the network namespace, so that are tied to a particular interface, and that you can similarly completely fail uh, to the point where your system doesn't work so well. Um, so definitely some room for improvement there. Uh, PTS is kind of similar. Um, there's a global limit on the system. Um, if people use more than that, then you're gonna run out and things won't work so well anymore. Um, your limits are also a bit it's problematic right now, uh, because unless you use a different uh, ID map for every container, which means if you want to be vaguely POSIX compliant, would mean 65,000 UIDs and GIDs per container, um, you have the problem that a container can, as one of the UID inside the container, if they use resources, then that's gonna count towards the, your limit of the other container next to it. Um, to the point where you can like, run out of FDs or that kind of thing, it, despite not having used those FDs in your container, it's someone else in another container next to you that happens to be using the same kind of UID that used it. Um, I think one of the main problems we were running into was related to a VAHI, um, which basically you could only run, ever run in a single container because it was setting a new limit and then nothing worked. Um, so that'd be nice if we can get that namespace somehow, but it's not completely obvious what we could tie it to. Um, so those are like the main issues we've got. Like everything else, as far as, I mean, on a recent kernel, perfectly up to date, et cetera, et cetera. There are no ways of escaping the container um, that we are aware of. Um, but um, you can still DOS the host, which is a bit problematic when you consider giving root access to some of people to that kind of system. Um, I said I would also mention briefly what we use as far as security. We do, um, so right now, yeah, it's user namespace is our main uh, security option. Uh, we use that by default for our containers. Um, you can turn it off if you really want to, but we strongly recommend you don't. Uh, on top of that, we do have an AppArmor profile which blocks some things. So it basically, it tags every container with its own profile, and then it prevents cross-profile uh, sending of signals and passing circuits and all that stuff. So, it basically is a safety net in case you do actually manage to escape your container, then you'll still have that kind of confinement applied to you. Uh, we also block a couple of syscalls by default uh, using second blacklist uh, for really bad syscalls that you should never have access to. Um, but because we run a full distro in there, we have no idea what other people are gonna be using, so we can't go the second comp whitelist way, which is what we would like to be doing. Um, and now to Daiko. Uh, check. All right. Cool. Hi. Um, so uh, one of the things that LexD does is it does uh, checkpoint restore, and so um, I, uh, in doing this, you run a lot of across a lot of various oddities, um, and so I'm just going to go through one of them that uh, maybe somebody in this room knows how to fix. Uh, I I don't think there's a security problem here, but somebody who knows better can look at it. Basically, if you're trying to write to sysctls. Um, the experience you get uh, from user space is kind of strange. Um, so the various sysctls that um, control knobs that are net namespace related, um, the whatever the task um, that opens those sysctls when you write to that file, it changes the values for that network namespace. But um, in the IPC and UTS namespaces, uh, when you whatever the task that writes to that file. Um, that's the task that it changes for. Um, but the problem is that nobody can open these sysctls for the IPC namespace besides real root. So what you end up doing is you have a, when you're trying to reconstruct the state of a, a, 
uh, process tree that's your container and you're migrating it, you have this daemon that opens this thing and it sends the FD across and then the c container's namespace writes to that um, IPC or UTS namespace sysctl, which is kind of awkward um, because you can actually just do that with set host name anyway. So there's a little bit of just like, it just doesn't uh, all quite line up. So I don't know, maybe somebody knows how to fix this. Uh, there are a few other examples that I have like this, but this is just one that I thought I'd mention um, before going into um, more stuff. Uh, so Checkpoint Restore is sort of similar to uh, the antithesis of security <laughs> because uh, you need to do a lot of things um, that are privileged operations. And so one of the things that Case is laughing as I switch to this slide, last year at this uh, conference at this time, uh, I was implementing uh, an option called ptrace suspend seccomp. And basically what, what, what uh, happens here is when you try and checkpoint a container, um, what the checkpointing tool does is it, um, since not everything, like all of the, the processes state is visible from the outside world, like you can't, even as a root process, you can't look at some particular uh, values for a process. Um, it injects some code into that process's address space and runs it so that it can scrape all of that information and then sends it back over. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that if you've used Minijail or some other container tool to apply a seccom policy that potentially prevents open uh, or read or whatever, then uh, that task is immediately killed when you suspend it and inject this little bit of code to scrape its state. So what you need to do is temporarily disable all of these security mechanisms so that you can inject this process and scrape the state, which is why uh, everybody's laughing. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so we have this for SecComp, and I've been kicking this down the road for uh, other security features, but uh, recently we had a report in the wild of um, another application's uh, app armor policy blocking uh, things. And so um, we need a similar option where you temporarily turn off the LSM if we want to be able to checkpoint and restore these kinds of things. Um, so please don't get mad if I send a patch that does something like this in the future. That's why I'm doing it. Um, so what is what is what is this little bit of code that you inject need to do? Um, what we one of the things that is needed is you need a, a open file handle to the a, a valid slash proc so you can inspect that um, for the inside the container. And so in the worst case, if the slash proc for the container doesn't match the PID namespace that it's in, you need to mount proc. Of course, uh, you know if the container's unprivileged, it can't do that anyway. And so there's some cases you just can't handle, um, but. But that's kind of a worst case. I mean, we also need to uh, create and connect to a Unix socket so we can send all this information back out of the container. Um, so there are some things that are mostly reasonable that you might want to do from this little blob of code that is injected. Um, anyway, and the la this last bullet point is case uh, when I think we were finally close to agreeing on this. Uh, this is what he said. This feature gives me the creeps. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's pretty cool. Uh, the end result, not the middle part. Um, and so it's, there's some other work also in the sort of in the security realm um, that's uh, you, to uh, allow checkpoint and restore of nested namespaces, in particular the nested user namespaces. You need a tree to be able to inspect what that hierarchy looks like. Um, and so that's also in progress by uh, some guys at Virtuoso. Um, but that's all I have, so please don't kill me. <laughs> all right. Um, so since we have a bit of time, let's go with demos. A um, few different things. Uh, you need to switch the right terminal over there. There we go. Okay. Um, so first thing, I've got a legacy system right here. Um, you can see it's running a bunch of containers, uh, different distros. We've got. Um, Alpine Linux, CentOS, Debian, uh, demo container that's open to based, I think, and uh, streamer container that will play with a bit data. Um, if you, like, if I look at that particular machine, I've got uh, 18 gigs of RAM in there, um, and I've got some amount of space, 220 gigs or so. Um, if I go into one of those, all of those are unprivileged containers, I can actually just prove that real quick. Uh, if we go down to wherever they are, come on. 
there we go. Uh, we see that they're all running as UID 100,000, or just a bunch of zeros, because that's it's getting the first character, apparently. Um, but yeah, they're all running as 100,000 in there. Um, and so if I enter one of those containers, I don't think that Debian one. Um, we see it's got uh, the ZFS pool I'm using right there, so that's 50 gigs or so, so that's the printer does 46, apparently. Uh, and I've got all the memory for the host, and I don't have any kind of limit, so I can, if I was to run, a, say, a fog bomb in there, it would be kind of bad right now. Um, but we can easily enough fix, fix that stuff, so we can set, uh, we've got a bunch of, that's the abstraction we built on top of C groups because people can't figure out C groups. So um, uh, let's start. The first interesting one is if you've got CPU info, we see we've got eight CPUs. Now, if I was to do limits CPU, just one, three of them. Go back in there, and I'm done to three CPUs. Uh, container still running. We apply all of those things live. We don't need any restart of any, anything. Um, so that's how you limit. CPUs, now if I wanted to limit memory a bit, 512 megs of memory, and that's it, it's done. Um, now, I've honestly got no idea whether that's gonna be working, but, uh, because my, that's running, uh, whoops, uh, that's running back home, and my home internet is not super happy right now. Um, um, let me just find my usual test URL for downloads because that's the only way I can really show you the network part of this. Um, that's the usual one. And let's move back to having terminals everywhere. There we go. Uh, let's see if that thing will download. Oh, okay. Let's take an Ubuntu container, which does have wget installed by default. Uh, and that's the part where. Ooh, okay, so that's working, sweet. All right, um, so what I'll be doing is I'm just gonna run that thing into a loop. There we go. I'm gonna start another shell, and I'm just gonna do, um, um, this one is actually using a profile. So profile is like an aggregation of configuration options that you can then apply to a bunch of containers to make your life easier. I can either set it to the command line like I did for the first one, or I can even just edit with a text editor, which apparently is nano on this machine. <sighs> no idea why. Uh, so, I mean, if we go back there, we see it's turning pretty down quickly, like about 500 megabit a second, which is reasonable. Now, let's do 10 megabit instead. Okay, so I'll just save that, and if I go back here, we see it's going down and down and down. Oh, and stabilizes at 10 megabit. And if I go back in my profile, and I bump it to, uh, I don't know. Uh, bump that thing a bit to 100 megabit, and we're going back up and what 100 megabit. So that's pretty convenient. If some one of our containers misbehaving, you can just slam down, and you don't have to figure out how to get TC to what to do what you want, because otherwise the container will be done with doing whatever it is doing before you can figure out the actual command line to get it to stop doing that. Um, so that was pretty um, straightforward and useful. Um, now I can also um, apply, let's take the Debian container. Um, it's got a device called root, which is a root file system. I've got a size property. I can set it to 10 gigabyte. And if I go in there, we're down to 10 gigabytes. Sweet. Um, so that's all nice and everything. Now, you can, as I mentioned, like LexD walks across the network. So I've got a second host. It works kind of like Git. You've got a LexD remote command line. You can list all the remotes you've got. And then you can list or do any command you want on a remote host by just doing its name followed by a colon. We see there's nothing on that particular host. But I do have a bunch of containers here. Let's see that Alpine container there. That's doing absolutely nothing right now. How about I move it? Done. Um, and that was actually done with live migration. The container wasn't stopped. So it was just serialized, transferred, restored with crew on the other side. Um, the same can be done, and I'm gonna show you another container here. Like, let's take, uh, I can try that CentOS one. I can do stop on the CentOS container, saying I want to record the state. There we go, so and the container is stopped. Um, 
If we look, there's no more process actually running from it. And if you start it again, it's back. So also it stored states to disk and restored it from there. Pretty convenient if you want to do like a quick kernel update, you can just stop all your containers, serializing them to disk, do a key exec to reboot really quickly to the new fixed kernel and then restore your containers. Get like five seconds of time, well done time kind of thing, uh, which most people would be fine with. Um, we can create snapshots of containers. Um, and again, let's take the CentOS container. So I can create a new snapshot called blah for that container. If I go and look at it, we see it's got a snapshot at the bottom and it's marked as being stateless. Now I can do the same command again with like blah one and pass stateful. There we go. And now I can restore that particular container, which is CentOS container, to um, that particular thing. Taking a bit longer than I expected, what's going on? No, there we go, just took a little while. Um, but none of that was particularly visual because, I mean, for all you know, that container might have been stopped and restarted every time. So let's do something slightly more interesting. Um, hold on, what's going on? Did my home internet just decide to die now? That would be really annoying. Uh, let me just check real quick. Oh it's, oh, it's just my laptop's internet died. Okay, so that I can deal with. My home internet would be way worse than that. All right. Okay, let me just bounce the Wi-Fi. Network Manager, you can do it, come on. If you're relying on the Wi-Fi, it seems to collapse for everybody. Oh. oh, really? Okay, so that might be a tiny bit of a problem then. Uh, My email just stopped syncing, so I suspect that's an indicator. Huh. Uh, well, let's see, it's reconnect. Attempting to reconnect now. Uh, scanning. It looks like it just reconnected for me, but the applet decided to crash, so I just need to restart that. There we go, and now the VPN, and hopefully I'll be back in business. VPN connected. All right, let's see if that session survives the... Yay! All right. Uh, that output is not as nice as I thought it would be, but uh, it's kind of working. Okay, so I've got a container. All it does is it sends, it's got a tiny service that sends a number every second to another IP. That's the receiver side of it. It's basically just netcat. Um, that container is what we see here as streamer. So now if I was to do, say, mm, which one can we do first? Let's do stop. So streamer and state for. Okay, so it stopped counting, as would be expected. And I can start streamer again. And it starts exactly where it was. Now, let's do a snapshot of that thing. Um, I don't just state full snapshot. There we go. Okay, so I've got that snapshot done now. Um, we are at, well, from what you see on the screen, it's gonna be like five, yeah. 56, 68, let's say, there about. Now, let's do restore of that snapshot. We just went back in time. Yeah. And lastly, let's just move that thing out of the way. So that container is currently on that host and let's move it to the other one. That's gonna take a little while because the file stem is pretty big. So it first starts transferring the file stem and stuff in background, doesn't actually stop the task or anything. Um, once it's done with the file system, it's gonna freeze uh, briefly the task to transfer its state and then restore it on the other side. Um, we should see it happen now. Okay, so now it's freezing, it's freezing and restoring. Anyway, hey, done. So if I go back here, we'll see it's gone from this machine and it's on the other one. So. 
that's why we need all those crazy canal interfaces, it's so we can do that kind of stuff. Um, now back to slides. And we've got 15 minutes, that's pretty good. All right, so just to recap kind of what I, I covered. Um, as far as I'm concerned, unprivileged containers are perfectly safe. I mean, the design makes them safe in that you cannot escape them. Now, there are a bunch of LSMs, as all, you all know, that we can use as extra safety net. Uh, we do make use of that wherever it makes sense. Um, we even, uh, in the case of AppArmor, we're working to get AppArmor stacking working so that you can use AppArmor profiles against processes inside the container uh, and have those confined in there. Um, that's gonna be pretty useful for people who use those containers, exactly like they use VMs, which is exactly what we're going for with FlexD. Um, it's still much easier to DOS the kernel than we would like. Um, as I mentioned, you can run the kernel out of PTYs or network interfaces, uh, one routing table entries, that kind of stuff, pretty easily, which will then affect everyone on that host. Um, C groups do a pretty good job at letting you limit um, uh, process count, memory, CPU, etc. For everything else, the go-to answer is you need to use kernel memory limits. The problem is not all kernel structures are the same size, so it's not particularly useful. Uh, if you set a tiny limit, it might prevent you from DOSing anything, but it will also prevent you from running anything useful. Um, so we need something that's a bit more fine-grained there, whether it is tying more resources to namespaces where it makes sense, or whether it is adding more C group controllers for other kind of resources that need to be global, but that we really want to be able to limit uh, for set of processes. Um, we do get a bunch of additional requests because we run those in privileged containers and we tell everyone to use those and really not use security privilege unless you know exactly what you're doing and unless you're basically the only one ever running in there or anyone you give access to that container also has a root on the system. Um, so we do get some interesting requests, and that's why Seth has been working on, on things like Fuse inside the container. We do have people who want to man file systems inside the unprivileged containers. Uh, when they use containers like they use virtual machines in the cloud, they like to attach a block device and mount it. Um, we do have a patch set to allow that for X4, but obviously it's under a flag that the user has to switch to on, which basically means, yes, everything that's in there is written by my, the same company that owns the host, and yes, we know that it's not particularly safe, but we really, really want to do it. Um, so we've got the flag for that. Fuse, on the other side, should be safe by design. I mean, it was designed for unprivileged users to run five systems to begin with. So doing that inside an previous container makes sense. Um, but said that Ceph has makes that possible. Uh, we can then run squash fuse or the squash, uh, the fuse equivalent of X4 or whatever other file system in there. We don't need to use dupe devices or anything. We can just mount whatever we want. And it's not as fast, sure, but at least you can do it. Um, there are some requests that we're getting that are just not reasonable as well. Um, I mean, there, there are good reasons why some users, some previous users are not allowed to bump some particular syscattles, and having people request that we let them do that inside an previous container is just not reasonable. Uh, we could uh, add extra semantics in LexD itself to have LexD, which is root on the host, bump those for you when it makes sense, but not have users be able to do whatever they want. Um, and as Daigo kind of covered, checkpoint restore is pretty hard. It's working, but it's only working in some setups. And that system was pretty standard. Like all those containers were clean. It was a clean next installation on two machines that have matching CPU flags, so that just works. Um, but if you, some kind of file systems being mounted here and there cause problems with live migration, um, if you're using external resources, you've got some problem there. Some network device types uh, we can serialize right now, etc. There are a whole bunch of things that um, we are basically just getting all of our users to file bugs and then prioritizing what's the next thing we need to get to serialize and, and deal with for, for that particular use case. Um, and that's it. Uh, I've got a bunch of LexD stickers if people are interested in that. Um, we've got contact info, our website is there. Usually, and as I mentioned, my home internet doesn't work so well right now. Uh, my IPv6 connectivity is kind of dead and my ISP is trying to figure that out. But when it does work, on our website you can click demo and you get a root shell inside the LexD container that then has nesting support enabled so that you can start containers and stuff. It's meant for people to 
try the LexD experience, not for people to try and find zero days inside the kernel. <laughs> there are attempts of use that cannot tell you as much. There's also a file hidden in slash root on the host that you might be able to read if you find a way out. But <laughs> it's been working pretty well. We've had so far about 20,000 people um, playing with that online. Nobody managed to crash the server in any way. Um, we have a few fog bombs a day. Um, not a huge deal because we do, yeah, we, we do set a limit, I think, to, of 500 processes in those environments. So they just use 500 processes and that's it. I mean, yes, they just DOS themselves. Congratulations, we can't use that container anymore. But it's not a big problem for us because you can still spawn as many others as you want on the side and it works perfectly fine. Uh, since we, we pin the CPU, we pin um, CPU time as well, so they can't actually run us out of resources so easily. Mm. So what we have noticed quite a bit is when they try to do that kind of stuff, what just happens is they eventually trigger the out of memory killer and it just bombs everything in the container and <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like it's, not, it's, it's not a huge deal for that particular use case. You might, it might be a bit, a bit more of a problem if you run like a VPS company, but for the demo website kind of thing, it works great for us. Um, <laughs> Um, what else are they doing? I and mean, network and everything is extremely restricted in there, so they can't do anything too stupid. Um, they still try, but yeah, not particularly successful. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. And LexD is available in a bunch of distros, mostly Ubuntu because we work for Canonical, but uh, someone is actively trying to figure out how to get it in Debian. Uh, it is packaged in CentOS and Arch Linux. Um, and I'm sure some other distros have picked it, picked it up by now. Uh, it is written in Go, um, but all the container part is actually through libelxc, which is a C library. Uh, so we use C Go to, to do all the interesting bits in C and just leave the running a multi-threaded complex web server part to Go. Um, and something I didn't show us, but that's also pretty cool, is we do support a whole bunch of pass-throughs. So you can say, like, whenever I plug a USB device that's got that vendor ID and that product ID, or just that vendor ID, pass it into the container. And what will happen is that LexD as a U event handler will notice that device showing up, will create the dev bus USB path in there, set up your C group devices so that you can write to it, and there you go. Um, I gave a demo two days ago on that where I was doing uh, ADB, so the Android debug um, utility, from inside a LexD container, because I didn't want to run like a static binary that Google built for me, uh, inside, on the RT online machine. And that's it. I think we've got about seven minutes for questions, if there are any. Um, otherwise, I guess we can just wrap up early. Uh, any question? Well, I guess it's dinner time then. Thank you.